So what I would like to do in the next uh, about half an hour is to um, show you our network, particularly the Swiss FluxNet um, and the methodology that um, uh, provide us with these high time resolution measurements. And then also give you some insights on the one hand um, um, from long term data. But then also, since it's high resolution, also about very short term responses and to two aspects that um, interests, I guess, many of us. Um, uh, this is environmental climate change extremes, in this case, the summer drought, um, but then also management, um, uh, since um, uh, how much I understand from Fenorop is also about what can we do um, and implement and apply and come up with strategies to make um, uh, agriculture um, more sustainable. And then at the end, um, uh, some of our conclusions that we have um, based on our data. So um, uh, from the very front, it's not just me, it's my group and all interns and guests and so on. So the thanks go to many in the group um, and also beyond. And the big motivation to work um, on these greenhouse gas fluxes in agriculture is to see what is the impact of agriculture on climate change. And this is the focus of today. Um, we also look at the, um, uh, as you've seen with the extreme events, the effect of climate change on agriculture. Um, but um, it goes both ways. So agriculture is driven by climate change, but also driving climate change. And now for Switzerland, um, agriculture is responsible for about 13% of the greenhouse gas emissions um, um, of the country that come and originate in agriculture. And that's to a large extent, that's um, uh, methane from our ruminants and Swiss agriculture or Switzerland always says Switzerland is a grassland. Um, uh, so 70% of our agricultural area in Switzerland is used for livestock. On the other hand, we also have N2O emissions um, uh, that come from uh, um, fertilization, um, very much organic fertilization with farmyard manure and slurry. But then obviously also how we manage that um, uh, and what's coming from the soils. So these are these 13.3% from the last national inventory report that came out last year covering data from 2020 and 2021. But now what measurements do we use? And um, the core measurements that we apply in my group is called the eddy covariance technique that can be used for any gas. We use it for uh, CO2 and water vapor, but also for methane, so CH4 and nitrous oxide, so N2O. And what we have is we um, on the agricultural sides, we have a mast that depends a little bit on the height of the vegetation. It should be about one third higher than the um, than the maximum height. And we measure concentrations um, with a gas analyzer or with an inlet and then uh, to a laser spectrometer and wind speed with a 3D anemometer where we measure, um, in this case, it's here um, CO2. And we measure the net exchange, so the net ecosystem exchange that is composed um, by two large fluxes if we talk about CO2, so respiration and assimilation. And depending on which process at any point in time is dominating the ecosystem either acts as a sink or as a source. And we measure at high time resolution, meaning at 20 hertz, so 20 times per second, 24-7, 365, and um, most of our sites now run for quite some time. And you see that little um, bluish thing that's um, uh, swirling around our site at um, uh, the, an intensively managed grassland. And we spatially integrate. And when we uh, sum up and integrate all those different um, footprints, how we call that, then you get to the map to the lower right where we can calculate where the air and the CO2 is coming from that we measure at that one point in time, one point in space. Um, uh, according to the ISO lines. So uh, you have to make sure that 80% um, at least is from the area that you would like to, so that you don't measure either adjacent housing areas, highways, whatever. <laughs> 
So that works pretty well and is a well-established um, uh, technique that's used globally in Fluxnet or also in ICOS, for example. Um, ICOS um, is a European research infrastructure and um, uh, I'm the national contact point for ICOS Switzerland, not with an agricultural site, but with our forest site. Um, uh, so, and here to the left, you see the uh, um, uh, map for ICOS, where the ecosystem and the atmospheric measurements take place. But we also um, know that this is a global network. And here you see the latest global map to the left. And about two years ago, um, uh, we had a very big publication on the methodology where 212 sites of those about 800 sites that are not all active any longer have been used. But what was very eye-opening is that if we look at the croplands, there were only 20 of those 212 sites that were cropland sites. And that's now only for CO2 and water vapor. So if we go down to non-CO2 greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide, this number for cropland will come down to one hand, if not less. So uh, there are still many ecosystem types that are underrepresented, in addition to, for example, Africa, where there are hardly any sites um, uh, that measure fluxes on a regular basis. Now, within Switzerland, in the last 20 years, we've built up the Swiss FluxNet. So we have six active flux sites distributed around the country. Four of them are agricultural sites. We have to the very left in the west, we have Önsingen, which is close to Solothurn, um, which is an agricultural and arable site that runs since December 2003. And then in 2005, we added two grassland sites, Kamau and Fribühl in the in close vicinity to Zug. Um, and then in 2006, we started at an alpine site um, uh, close to Breda in uh, um, the Grissons so or Graubünden. Alp-Weisenstein, where at the beginning we only measured in summer, and then uh, in November 2014, we got mains power and could actually measure year-round. And we also have these two forest sites, the Lagan, which is a mixed forest close to Zurich, that's running since 2024, um, and Davos, actually a site um, that we inherited from um, colleagues and were running since 2005 ourselves. And with those sites, um, uh, the beauty is that we measure continuously, as I said, at 20 hertz. So we get 1.7 million data points per gas that we're looking at per day. And with these measurements, we can now see responses to environmental change as well as management. But we also use those sites as a research platform. And to the left, you see um, uh, some of those um, projects that are running. And since we now run them since yeah, Davos now is in its 26th year, we can now also look at response to slow changes like climate change. And so, and that's a nested approach with also other projects at the same sites, also colleagues coming to those sites, which is really nice. And I would like to talk and present data about two sites in this talk. One is our Kamau grassland site at 400 meters elevation. So about 10 degrees C as an annual average and about 1100 millimeters per year. Um, uh, it's a can be soil and it has been grassland since quite some time. It's intensively managed and you see the setup and intensively managed in Switzerland means four to five cuts per year. A little bit grazing, not too much. And after each cut, there is a slurry application. This site has hardly seen any manure or mineral fertilization in the last 16 years. And in 2015, we then also started a N2O, a nitrous oxide mitigation experiment, where we substituted the organic fertilizer by an increased fraction of legumes. And I'll show you some data for that later. The average yield for um, uh, this intensively managed grasslands is, um, uh, is, is good. So seven to 11 tons dry matter per hectare and year. But now how do those high time resolution greenhouse gas measurements look like? We have typically two ways of presenting them. The top two panels is what we call a fingerprint. 
where you see on the x-axis the months of a year and on the y-axis you see the time of the day. So from midnight to noon to midnight and the color code gives you the CO2 flux at, based on half hourly measurements. And since this is a method that came from the atmospheric sciences, if the um, sign is negative, um, the atmosphere is losing CO2, meaning the ecosystem is gaining CO2. This is photosynthesis going on. And if the sign is positive, then the atmosphere gets CO2. Or the ecosystem means it's losing CO2, means it's respiration. And you nicely see for that intensively managed grassland that for those two different years in the winter, one in 2013, it was a little bit harsher than in 2018. The season typically starts um, at that site somewhere in April. And once in a while, you see these yeah, yellowish, brownish gaps after a cut. And this is not that we're lacking data, but that that ecosystem right after the cut, since you cut the biomass and there's nothing to photosynthesize for the next couple of, of days or weeks, um, because it first needs to regrow, um, you have a constant shift in sink and source behavior during the year, if we only look at the, at the fluxes. The other way is to present those data is in the lower panel, which you accumulate these fluxes over um, uh, all half hourly values that we have. By definition, first we start 1st of January at zero, and then you add up the uptake or the release. And you can see that over those many years, most of these um, years clearly were on having a carbon sink behavior. So negative numbers of the cumulative NEE except for one year, which was 2012, which was a year of a sword renewal. And this is the basis for um, all our data analysis. And we can here immediately see that the CO2 fluxes at ecosystem level are highly variable and clearly depend on management and environment. And how, I will show you in, in a second. What we can also do, we can now calculate carbon budgets. And here we need not only to look at our NEE, so our net ecosystem exchange, um, but we also need to look at the exports in green, which is the harvests, so carbon that's removed from the site, but also carbon imports, meaning organic fertilization in our point. And only then we see the real carbon sink and carbon source that we're interested in when we look at the Paris Agreement or the four per mil initiative and so on. So we need to have a look at the black columns, which are um, uh, relatively small. And you also see that over the years, um, typically that ecosystem was a small sink, except for 2012. This was the renewal year. Um, where the farmer had decided that the vegetation composition was not good enough to feed the cows. So uh, it was a renewal with glyphosate um, applications or so killing off everything that grew there and then plowing and then reseeding. And for the fluxes, the farmer was right because the uptake, the following three years were perfect. Also what could be exported, so the harvests and the um, uh, net ecosystem uh, productivity, so the net biome productivity, the carbon sink also were at decent numbers. However, then came 2016, which was a very, very wet year. So you can see there's hardly any, um, uh, any um, NEE, so carbon sink behavior, and the whole ecosystem was, beyond that renewal year, the first time that we measured was a carbon source. And then the next three years, 18, 19 and 20 in Switzerland were, were pretty warm. So also there, um, the uh, uptake was much lower. In addition, a nitrogen mitigation experiment started at half of the, the area. So the inputs were, were different, which also um, you can see that the imports here in, uh, in lilac in violet are very small compared to the years before. So overall, over all 16 years, um, uh, the grassland behaved as a sink, where the sink depended on management and environment. 
Um, it was about 0.7 tons carbon per hectare and year. Without the renewal year, a little bit higher, 0.9, so about a ton carbon per hectare and year. Um, and that we could also validate with soil carbon stocks. So, uh, which means we, we, found, we found the sink. And the second site um, uh, that I will show you some more data on is our arable site um, uh, in Önsingen, which has a similar elevation as the intensively managed grassland at the Kama. Um, also, average temperature is about 10 degrees, 1100 millimeters. Here, the soil is different. Um, uh, it's um, uh, coming into stagnating water once in a while. It's not a clay soil yet, but still it can be soil. But because of the clay texture, once if it rains a lot, you see some puddles. And it's managed with a three-year crop rotation since the last uh, late 1990s. And in Switzerland, we have special ecological um, requirements for the farmers to receive compensation. They have to manage according to what we call the proof of ecological performance, um, where fertilization and so on um, is restricted to certain times and also amounts. The main crops in that crop rotation are cereals, winter wheat, winter barley, and then also intermixed rapeseed, pea, and lots of cover crops um, as well. It's organic fertilization, again, with manure and slurry, because most of our um, uh, farms in Switzerland have integrated production, meaning livestock plus um, plant production. And the average grain yields are also in a, in, a, in a normal way with about seven to eight tons per hectare. Now, this is our longest running site, except of the forest site. And here I'll show you the, the net biome productivity. So taking into account exports and imports again. Um, and here, um, uh, since we um, looked at the sink, we changed the, the sign convention. So here now negative goes into sink and positive into, into source um, relationships. And the different colors give you the different crops over the different crop rotations. So you can see that the orange um, uh, cropping season fluxes um, are typically the largest for wheat and for the greenish ones for barley. Um, if we look at the cover crop, for example, in uh, um, uh, 20, 2005, this is um, like a phacelia that's growing, but then also plowed under, so nothing is taken away from the, from the site. Um, uh, we had some potato and some peas, but overall you see that accumulating over those um, um, 13 years of measurements, um, uh, the different crops show very different fluxes and um, uh, the cover crops really stabilize that carbon budget. But when we look and see um, uh, and also try to understand where this flux behavior is coming from, we see also manure and slurry applications also bare soil. Um, uh, we see that over those 13 years that we have put together here, that arable site was a carbon source, um, about 1.3 tons per hectare a year. Also, again, validated with soil carbon stocks. So we lost carbon out of the soil which for that um, site um, uh, in a temperate region with quite a lot of fertilization and decent temperatures, we concluded that the option to reduce the carbon loss from croplands are rather limited. So the four per mil initiative for that site will never be reached because we do not sequester carbon at that arable site, but we actually lose carbon and quite a bit per year. And this can also then, uh, the data can also be used to not only look at the long-term perspectives, um, uh, but also at short-term responses. And the summer in 2018, similar to what um, Germany experienced in Switzerland was a very hot year. Here you see these fingerprints, this time not for um, uh, carbon, uh, but for temperatures where you nicely see the two years that we compared it to, 2016, 2017, and 2018 was um, the warmest year on record. Maybe we don't have the final numbers yet from Meteo Swiss um, uh, compensated or uh, took over, taken over by 2022. But at that point in time, when we looked at the data, 2018 together with 2020 were the warmest year. 
and also very warm spring, summer and fall since the instrumental measurement started in Switzerland in 1864. Now we compared the sites um, uh, that had um, uh, the same vegetation on in those three years, taking 2016 and 2017 as a benchmark and then uh, looked at what happened in 2018. And now for the Kamau site, so our intensively managed grassland, if we now go from right to left, so we have these high temperatures in 2018 so that um, red blob is 2018 and the two lower blobs are for 2017 and 2016. But we also had high VPD values and very low soil water contents. So you see that in 2016 and 2017, although in summer it was low, it was not as low as what that site experienced in 2018. And therefore also looking at the net CO2 fluxes, they were much, much lower. And you can actually see that here um, very clearly in summer 18. At the end, um, uh, we had not only a dry um, summer from the soils perspective, but also from the atmosphere. Um, uh, and I think that notion that dryness now comes from both sides, from below via soil and soil dryness and from high VPD values, so vapor pressure deficit, um, stressing the vegetation at those high air temperatures resulted in very low yields. And when we partitioned our net ecosystem flux in assimilation and respiration, here expressed as GPP, so gross primary productivity and ecosystem respiration. Both of those fluxes went down um, with NEP then uh, slightly decreasing since that is the sum of both of them. And but about uh, one quarter less yield than in the, um, in the years before. So for our sites that we compared here, the lowland grassland was really most vulnerable. And um, but there are also winners. And in 2018, the winners was our alpine grassland, um, uh, which is located um, in Graubünden in, in the Grisson at 2000 meters, very extensively managed, only grazing during the short summer season. And we had very high temperatures for that site. Um, uh, so well in the mid of the 20s and yeah. A, um, also a high VPD, so a dry atmosphere, but because it had a big snow cover in the winter 1718, we had very high soil water contents in that summer 2018. And that ecosystem was just thriving. The yields actually increased compared to the two years before by 15%. So it was the winter in, in the summer, it profited from the melted snowpack from the winter before. As I just had shown you, the lowland grassland had a yield decrease by 25%. The bad news here is that our projections for climate change um, tell us that in the future, we will have less snow, less snowpack, more precipitation in winter, which means that insurance almost, this snowpack that can melt because also at that point in time, spring started relatively early at 2000 meters will be gone um, by mid end of the century. And so that was now a lot about CO2, but um, uh, we also um, uh, need to take into account the non CO2 um, fluxes. And we focus on uh, nitrous oxide, so N2O fluxes, um, uh, where in grasslands, we have about a dozen of sites that measure N2O fluxes with the edicovariance, so this micrometrological technique, so not with chambers. Um, it's much less in uh, arable, I'll show you in a sec. And here we put together um, a data set between 2010, where at that site, we actually started with chamber measurements. And then in 2012, we um, uh, added the edicovariance which were running since um, 2012. And you can see that particularly in 2012, when we had the renewal, which meant the grassland was killed, glyphosate, then here you can see um, in the meantime, um, uh, when uh, 
everything was kind of killed and only our little side was still there before that was actually taken out as well and then re-sown. Um, you see in 2012, huge N2O fluxes and fluxes that were as high as never again, not even in the following years. And that came to our big surprise because with these large N2O fluxes, when you then calculate the greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent, it um, uh, became very clear that um, uh, this sword was a carbon equivalent, but also a CO2 source the very first time. And this renewal actually took out, when we look at the CO2 equivalent sink, about five years of, of carbon sink, of CO2 equivalent sink. Now, in Switzerland, such a renewal is done every six to seven years, which means um, uh, we're losing quite some uh, carbon uh, over longer time periods when the renewal is done as aggressively as it has, done, has been done in 2012. Which also means that even though we have carbon sequestered at one point in time in the soil, Similar to in forests, there is no permanency of those soils and soil carbon. And um, uh, as you can see with the N2O fluxes, um, all that renewal had been taken place in February. But we see these high N2O fluxes the entire year. So it's not that there's an event and you immediately see the result, not in CO2 and also particularly not in, in nitrous oxide. Now, this is then when we started to think about how can we mitigate these N2O emissions, even during times when there is no renewal. And we uh, separated that footprint um, at the Kamau site into two parts. Um, uh, the southern part was our control part with organic fertilization. And um, uh, in the northern part, we substituted the organic fertilization by 100% with an increased fraction of legumes. So the legume percentage then at the end was between 30 and 40%. And it was interesting because at that point in time, we had the, the literature and also the scientific knowledge were not yet there to say what to expect. One hypothesis was that we don't fertilize, so which means and the legumes, they fix nitrogen and are in close relationship and um, facilitate also the grasses so that the N2O emissions should go down. And the other hypothesis was, well, we add legumes and they, since they don't get fertilized, they fix a lot and they fix too much and that we increase the N2O emissions. So it was a very interesting time. And um, since we had been measuring at that site before the experiment, we knew that the two parcels were um, pretty much the same in 2013 and 2014. And with the experiment, immediately in the same year, we saw a decrease of N2O emissions in the legume parcel, so the blue one, and the reduction was about um, 40 to 50 percent lower N2O emissions. We had about a 10% lower yields um, in the legume uh, parcel, but the yield had a higher quality because um, the nitrogen concentration was higher because of the higher legume fraction. Um, and we could even claim to support a little bit of more biodiversity with the increase in the legumes. So yes, legumes for N2O mitigation, they work as long um, as um, they are in. And then uh, we followed up that experiment um, uh, up to um, end of 2020. And here you see the slurry parcel at the top and the clover parcel um, uh, at, in the lower panels. And also there, the uh, overall N2O fluxes from the fertilized parcels were much higher than of the legume parcel. So uh, fertilized parcel between six and seven kilogram nitrogen lost um, uh, out of that site um, compared to about three to four kilogram of nitrogen from the legume parcel. Which also means that the results from the earlier years were really robust. So there we had 30 to 54 percent now we or 40 to 53 percent here. Now we have 36 to 54. So very much the same. Um, uh, and um, uh, which also showed that um, uh, it works 
Um, it mainly came about um, the lack of fertilization, um, uh, looking at the isotopic ratios in the N2O showed us that the microbes are actually um, uh, responsible for that. And it's like the, um, the, the soil nitrogen, it's not the, the biomass from the, from, the, from the legumes. What we also saw in the very dry years that the yields in the legume parcel were lower, 30%. Um, so the farmer was not very happy with us, um, uh, which means that now we have to see if we want to put that into practice. Um, uh, we need to, to check a little bit um, uh, how we can keep the yields at a decent way so that the farmer is happy as well. We also asked then the question, do we have any other further beneficial effects if we have the legumes in instead of organic fertilization with slurry? And we looked at nitrate leaching, and you can see here for two growing seasons, um, very significant results that the nitrate leaching was also reduced in the legume parcels. Um, the overall variability over winter, um, quite some uh, rain and um, less snow at 400 meters um, was not so clear, but um, uh, it was nice to see that for the losses to the atmosphere, as well as to the losses down to the groundwater, um, uh, these legumes really helped. So the question is, are there only positive effects? And then we have to say, well, unfortunately, no. Because if we now look at the carbon sink, and this here is now a um, very condensed graph, where on the y-axis you have the carbon sink, the net biome productivity that gives you if the entire ecosystem is a source or a sink, including harvest and fertilization. You see the different years as the annual sink or source. You see the renewal year 2012 um, uh, with a clear source, but you also see the years of our mitigation experiment. These are the years that have the red um, border where we have very low carbon inputs. And um, uh, with the low carbon inputs in terms of organic fertilization, you also get low nitrogen inputs. So these are the color codes. And what we see is that that grassland without organic carbon inputs is a carbon source. And that obviously comes then uh, with the trade-off for climate smart agriculture. Um, the trade-off between uh, carbon and nitrogen. So some uh, last slides. We also started measuring N2O fluxes then over arable because after all the interesting results over the grasslands, we thought, well, that might be cool to have a look. And we used um, uh, here a movable a roving tower and moved to a different site. Um, uh, but also in the lowlands of Switzerland, so about 400 meters elevation. And we followed a full cropping season of P. So these are the um, uh, panels, the three panels here to the left for CO2, A, nitrous oxide in panel B, and methane in panel C. And then we moved to maize. And you can see the site, um, uh, pretty nice um, done. And what we found is that in a very short pea season, so two months, we lost about one and a half kilogram of nitrogen from those peas that had not been fertilized because it's a legume anyway. And the emission factor that's calculated according to the IPCC guidelines was about one and a half percent. So linked to the biologically fixed nitrogen, which is about the TO1 emission factor that's typically used. Now, when we look at the maize, you see for the N2O here in panel B, huge N2O fluxes at the beginning of the season, which is May, June. And our emission factor for maize is 4.4%. So much higher, considerably higher than our IPCC TO1 methodology would suggest. For the methane fluxes, we're close to zero and don't really um, needs to be concerned about that. Now, the question was, what the heck? Why do we have these large N2O fluxes early in the season with maize? 
it could be because of fertilization, but that's, well, six weeks after, so we were kind of curious. And what this first peak here in P, no fertilization, no rain event. So it was really the, the problem, what the heck, how can we explain that? And then we went into machine learning, random forest analysis, and looked at um, vegetation height as a proxy for performance and the usual suspect water filled pore space for N2O fluxes. And you saw, see here now the same data set in those different colors for um, water filled pore space and the size of the symbols give you the vegetation height. And what we saw is that when the vegetation is short, independent if it's maize or pea, then the fluxes are high. And as expected, when the water um, in the soils is high, we also see high fluxes. But if we put things together, we can nicely see that independent of the water filled pore space, always when the plants are small, we have um, a strong competition by the microbes and they win, which means they can grab the nitrate and use it for themselves and also, by the way, um, uh, emit some N2O. However, if the plants are tall, even like here in August and September, when it's still pretty wet or can be pretty wet, then the plants win. Which means that whatever we do, we need a growth adapted fertilization um, and also maybe don't give the small plants as much nitrogen as the um, as the yeah, farming regulations would actually allow. And that then came to the very last question and the last data set I want to present you the question. So what happens if we do not have any plants on a arable site, which always happens if you have a crop rotation, um, you have harvested whatever main crop and you leave it bare soil for some time until you bring out the next crop. So with that um, thesis, we had four of those periods after rapeseed, after pea, after winter wheat, and after maize. And here are the data for the N2O fluxes. Um, typically the fertilization only comes at the end as like the head start for the next main crop, but we see very high fluxes similarly to um, what we saw um, in the uh, um, renewal year at the grasslands peaks above eight nanomoles per meter square and second, emission factors up to 12, so nothing, 1.5% like IPCC. So here the microbes really party in the soil because there is no plant to compete with. So a clear recommendation, don't have bare soil at any time in your arable sites. Which brings me to what are the recommendations or what we've learned from all these measurements in both croplands and then also in the grasslands. So uh, we think that the options to reduce the carbon loss from temperate problems are really limited, which um, puts the Paris Agreement and particularly the four per mil initiative really at stake. We have high nitrous oxide emissions when plants are small or absent. And that triggers a whole a range of climate smart management practices that we can do. However, we have um, a way with the cover crops to stabilize the budget and to reduce N2O emissions in these crop rotations. So we can start playing around with that trade off carbon or nitrogen. For the grasslands, it might become a little bit more difficult because we have vegetation there all the time, except we renew it. And there are also the data that I'd shown you was a very aggressive way with glyphosate plowing and reseeding. We had in 2021 another um, renewal that did overseeding instead of the herbicide. So we'll still need to have a look at the data. The organic fertilization is really good. It's needed for the carbon sink, which in Switzerland is um, also uh, supported by the compensation scheme. So we typically have integrated production. And um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, when we substitute the organic fertilization that's coming from the livestock on the farm, um, uh, we can reduce the N2O fluxes and the leaching of nitrate, but we also reduce the carbon sink, which means we have now here a trade off that we need to address um, uh, how, particularly on the grasslands, how to reduce the N2O losses 
while um, not reducing the carbon, uh, the CO2 sink. And I think that's most likely only possible if you decrease the livestock numbers on farm to decrease the amount of manure and slurry that needs to be distributed. So this is a glimpse on what we do. And so I would like to thank you for listening and I'm open for questions.